in this episode, you're going to learn how you can bring more and better questions into your work and how to convince others to do so as well. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Warren, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 131. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the hidden and invisible things that make a difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people and business. The guest in this episode is Warren Berger. He's the author of my favorite book of 2021 so far, which is called The Book of Beautiful Questions. It's no secret that every great solution starts with a great question. As a service designer, you're already naturally curious and probably asking a lot of questions. But the reality is that most likely you're in an environment where answers are more valued than questions. And when people do ask questions, they are mostly not the ones that we're hoping for. So in this episode, you're going to learn what happens when we don't start asking more and better questions, preferably the beautiful ones, and what you can do to get the people who are right now focused very much on the how questions to be more open for the why questions. I think the answers will surprise you. And during this episode, we're also going to announce a contest where you can win a signed copy of Warren's book. So make sure to stick around if you're interested in participating. It's actually really easy and we'll send a copy to you anywhere in the world. If you didn't know already, we publish a new video here on this channel every week or so. So if you want to keep growing as a service design professional, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of the future videos. I guess that's all for the introduction. And now let's jump into the awesome conversation with Warren Berger. Welcome to the show, Warren. Hi, it's great to be here, Mark. Really excited to have you on uh, this uh, episode. I am usually not a bit starstruck, but in this case I am because uh, I must say the book uh, is my, it's the most inspiring book I've read this year. And I'm not just saying that because you're here on the show. I actually invited you to <laughs> because of the book and uh, really happy to get the opportunity to dive into uh, these questions. Um, or, that's great. Before we do that, um, for the people who have no clue who you are, haven't read any books, haven't Googled you yet, could you give uh, a brief intro? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I call myself a questionologist, and which is a made up term, but uh, it's also something I'm very serious about because I really believe, you know, the, that there is there should be a serious study and practice of the art and science of asking questions. I mean, I think it's hugely important. And yet it is not really studied as a like as a separate discipline. Um, and so there is no such thing as, you know, while there are so many ologies out there for almost everything you can think of, there is no ology, there is no field of study that I know of that pertains directly to asking questions. So I've decided to make this kind of my own mission and uh, I got into it, um, I, you know, I came up as a journalist, uh, worked for newspapers, magazines for many years. That kind of got me initially into questioning because, you know, as a journalist, um, it's, it's sort That's of what a you stock do. and trade. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You know, you're asking questions all the time and you have to kind of work on your questions to try to make them better. Uh, so, so I was already in a way into this field and this study. But then something really changed about seven or eight years ago. I was doing a lot of writing about designers, about innovators, about business leaders. Uh, and I started to realize that they were all really great questioners. And so um, that changed my perspective on questioning a little bit. I had thought of it as something journalists do and maybe lawyers do and interview, you know, people are doing surveys, you know, that kind of thing. But when I started to think about it in terms of being such a powerful tool for creative people um, and innovators, when I started to think about it that way, I, I had a whole new angle on it. And that's, that's kind of the way I talk about it now. 
um, not just as a communication tool where you ask questions of somebody sitting across the table from you, but as a much bigger tool where you're using questioning to reimagine things or to solve problems or to design or to create. So, um, so that's kind of where I am now. I, I look at it as all, everything from a, 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 a business tool to a leadership tool to a relationship tool. And I just look at all the ways you can use questioning to, um, you know, to improve things. And uh, we'll get into that because uh, what what the book shown uh, has shown for me is that we often take a very narrow perspective on questioning, and we can broaden that much more. And there, like uh, a lot of new opportunities open. But again, we'll get into that in a second. Um, what we always do on the uh, service design show is a rapid fire question round, five questions. And the goal for you is to answer them as quickly as possible. Here we go, questioning, uh, just to get to uh, know you a little bit better. You haven't prepared this, these questions, so uh, that's right. the, the whole point. Um, okay. Ready? Yeah, sure, go. All right. What's always in your fridge? Um, what's always in my fridge? Milk, got milk. milk. God bless. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one is interesting. Which book or books are you reading at this moment? Oh, I am reading. Um, I just finished a book called The Splendid and the Vile uh, about Winston Churchill during the early start of World War II. Uh, I'm also, I usually am reading several books at the same time. I'm reading the original Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, don't know why, but I got into that. And then I'm reading a book about critical thinking that's called uh, Good. Good thinking is the mm. name of the book because mm. I'm very interested right now in critical thinking and which is an offshoot of questioning, you know, and so I, they're related and I'm very interested in that. Interesting. We'll add to the link to that in the show notes for sure. Right. Next question would be what uh, superpower would you like to have? Oh, what superpower? I, I mean, I think flying, you know, <laughs> it's predictable, but, you know, I, I, I love the idea of being able to fly. I think it's an amazing, uh, mm. you know, to just sort of soar through the air um, uh, on a more sort of realistic level. Um, I think I this superpower I would like to have would be uh, better vision, mm. uh, being able to see things uh, more clearly, being able to notice details more than I do. I'm a little bit. Um, I'm not as strong in that area as I wish I was. All right. Okay. Maybe someday uh, augmented reality, artificial intelligence will help us in that uh, area. Now, yeah. the, the final question is uh, related to service design. I know you're not a service designer, but you have had a lot of experience with design. I'm curious uh, if you recall when you uh, heard about the term service design, when did it come up in your uh, field? Hmm. You know, not much. I mean, and I write, I've written a lot about design, mm -hmm. um, but I do remember hearing it occasionally mentioned um, by uh, companies in the service industry, like hotel companies, people like that. But uh, in the wider sense, um, no, I don't really, I, I have not heard it that much. So this is kind of a new, a new area for me. And, and, and it's great because I like to have people on the show who are on the fringes of our field because that's where we learn the most. And I think there are strikingly a lot of uh, overlaps between what people call design thinking and service design. So uh, I think you, right. you, ha you have more experience with service design than you might actually uh, I probably do, yeah. recall. Um, one of the questions that I'd like to start with is uh, you've written... Um, a few other books and one of your first books if not the first one was on applying design in a business environment right could you take right. us back to that moment how did that book came to be yeah that that's it. i well you know I, my career has followed interesting sort of progressions where for a, for there was a period of time where i wrote a lot about advertising and i was very interested in advertising and marketing uh, and then i noticed that within the advertising industry uh, design was taking a greater and greater role. So I started to get interested in, in design firms and how they work and, uh, and in-house designers who would be working at either at ad agencies or at, or at the client companies. Um, and so I got very interested in design. And then as I started to talk to designers, 
um, this term design thinking started to come up. And I was never really that happy with the definitions of it. I thought it was a little bit um, jargony. Uh, and so my, my thought was, what if, you, what if I could take this concept of design thinking and try to break it down into the most simple terms? And to me, the most simple definition of design thinking is three words, how designers think, right? That's design thinking, if you break it down to the most basic level. So then I said, well, could I write a book that would attempt to describe some of the ways designers think? Um, you know, and obviously all designers think differently and it, it's gonna differ depending on what category they're in or whatever, but are there some common approaches they take? Are there some common principles? Are there some ways they tackle problems? So I, I talked to lots and lots of designers in different disciplines, and I was breaking down some of the basic things they do. And interestingly, that led to questioning, <laughs> because one of the things that designers, I was noticing all these designers were doing, was they were asking really big questions, and they would often start their project by attempting to answer a challenging question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the design challenge, the design brief. And uh, I, right. I think a curiosity is a sort of a natural uh, skill, characteristic, threat of, right. of designers. Um, yeah. After that uh, book, uh, according to your publication uh, list, it, it went silent for a few years. And then uh, yeah. you came out with a book on questioning. Right. How, how did that transition go? Well, it was great. I mean, what happened was actually my design thinking book um, didn't do as well as I hoped. It was it did OK, but it kind of went out there. And I think maybe I didn't have enough of a um, a hold in the in the design world, because at the same time I came out with my book, uh, IDEO, the firm IDEO uh, and its uh, chief Tim Brown, they came out with a book that was fairly similar. It was called Change by Design. And so my book, which was called Glimmer and Change by Design came out and Change by Design like did a little better than my book because I think IDEO had a little more of a, you know, a strength and a presence in the design world. But besides that, I was really hoping that Glimmer was not really just for designers. I mean, I was hoping Glimmer and my publisher was hoping that it was going to mainstream. It was going to be a mainstreaming of design, of thinking it like a designer. And it was going to go to the average Joe and say, would you be interested in learning something about how designers think? And do you think you could apply that to your own life or your own business? So, um, you know, we had great hopes that this would become a, uh, almost like that book Freakonomics or something, mm -hmm. you know, one of those really big phenomenon books. And it just didn't happen, you know, which is the way it is in book publishing. Sometimes hit, things hit, sometimes they don't. And so I was a little bit, it was a little bit of a disappointment for me, you know, but the interesting thing, the lesson I learned from that, and I've shared this with other people, is that sometimes within a, a failure, if you want to call it that, or a thing that doesn't work out as well as you'd like, is the seed, within that is the seed of something that could be successful. And the key there is you, ha you, you have to almost do a post-mortem on the project that didn't work. And be, in other words, a lot of times we just wanna put those things aside because they didn't work and we never wanna look at them again. We never wanna think about them again. But luckily what I did was I went back to it. I looked at what seemed to be working, what people were responding to in it, and I found one of the things they responded to was there was a chapter within that book, Glimmer, that was all about asking questions, asking beautiful questions. And, um, and so I said, hmm, you know, this is interesting. This is, whenever I do a talk about Glimmer, the one thing people always seem to seize on is the chapter on question. So I decided maybe that should be its own book. And the, then that book did very well. So. It's, you know, it's an interesting lesson there, I think. And uh, this is the way it goes. Like, it's hard to predict. And you just, the only thing you can do is keep pushing, uh, keep 
keep kicking the can forward. That's the thing yeah, I was and looking keep, for. Uh, and I think of it as iterating, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it was like, in a way, I could think of Glimmer as the first iteration on my questioning thing. I was, I hadn't quite gotten it focused yet. I hadn't mm -hmm. gotten it narrowed down. So I was talking about four or five things. But then when I got rid of the other three or four things and I just focused on questioning, then I had something really uh, tight and focused. Mm. Now, let's transition into uh, the questioning topic. You, um, I don't know if you coined it, but at least you you sort of uh, uh, took the, the, the beautiful question phrase and uh, linked it to your name. I'm curious, how would you describe a beautiful question? What makes a question beautiful? Well, it's a totally subjective term. So your idea of a beautiful question is probably going to be different from mine. Um, I decided that I wanted to use, I wanted to create a term that would um, make people think more highly of questioning. And originally, what I had, what I was working with, the original language I was using around this was, believe it or not, stupid questions. I was originally talking about stupid questions because one of the people I had been dealing with a lot was a designer uh, named Bruce Mao. Hmm. And, and Bruce Mao talked to me a lot about stupid questions. He, he was a big believer that as a designer, you have to be willing to ask the questions that the no one else mind. is asking. Yeah. Yeah. Like fundamental, very, sometimes very basic fundamental questions, which other people will consider to be naive or mm -hmm. stupid. So he was a big believer in stupid questions. But but I was I decided that that was not a good term to use for my book because I wanted the book to be a a celebration of questioning in general and I wanted it to be very um upbeat and optimistic and that word stupid just brings too much negativity into it. So so I decided to move transition to something else and then I came across this term beautiful question in a, uh, uh, it's from a, a poem by uh, the poet E.E. E. Cummings, who, who wrote, um, always the beautiful answer, who asks a more beautiful question. And I, that pretty much summed up what I wanted to say in my book, which is that if you're asking really great questions, you're going to get better answers, you're going to get better results. And and so that's, I said, I'm going to take that beautiful question, not only beautiful question, but I like the whole phrase, a more beautiful question. So, um, so that became my, my thing that I went with. And then I had to define what is what do I mean by a beautiful question. And so I cobbled together my own definition. And basically, I was looking for how do you distinguish the kind of special question from the run of the mill everyday question. And so the definition I came up with was that a beautiful question is, is a question that is very ambitious, uh, yet at the same time, it's actionable. So it's, it's big and ambitious, but you can actually act on it. You can do something and it has the potential to bring about change. So any question that fits those three, it's like three things, right? Ambitious, actionable, and potentially game-changing. That's a beautiful question. Mm. And do, do you have, are, are there any classic examples of those kind of questions just to get on They're mind? all over, yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> so what, what are your favorites? Like, which so, ones well, do work? Well, my favorite is, uh, is uh, that I tell a lot is the, um, the question that led to the Polaroid instant camera you know, 60, 70 years ago. And it was actually asked by the founder, uh, the daughter, the, the four-year-old daughter of the founder of the company. And the founder of the company was named Edwin Land. And, um, and so he was, uh, before he'd even really gotten deeply into the camera business, he was, in, he was doing um, optics and uh, headlights on cars and all kinds of stuff like that, but he wasn't deep into cameras. Uh, he was on vacation one time with his family. Uh, he's using a camera, not his camera, just a, you know, a camera from another company to take a picture of his family. Um, he takes a picture with this camera and then he puts the camera aside and his daughter, his four-year-old daughter wants to see 
the results. She wants to see the picture. And he tries to explain to her, no, it, it, it doesn't work that way. We have to send it, take the film, and we have to send it to the, and then we have to wait in it. So it's going to be about a week or whatever before we're going to see anything. And then his daughter asked him, why do we have to wait for the picture? So this was a beautiful question because what it did was it was it 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 sort of created this game changing moment when she asked him that question he had this realization like yeah why do we have to wait for the picture you know and what if we didn't what if we didn't have to wait and so that led to the beginnings of the polaroid instant camera mm, i i and guess you find so yeah. many you so find so many questions like that at the start of companies mm. or innovations somebody is looking at something that's not quite right and they're saying they're asking some version of a question like why does it have to be this way or why hasn't someone come up with a way to do this or that and those to me are the beautiful questions they're the questions that are really thinking about changing uh changing the game and it also uh, uh as I'm hearing you say, has to do with uh, the right moment and who is actually getting that question. Because maybe a question which is uh, plain, simple, and normal becomes a beautiful question uh, in the eyes of the, in the ears of the person who's listening to it, because it has Absolutely. to resonate with them. It has to at resonate. That, at that moment, like that question a year earlier or with a different person, maybe wouldn't, wouldn't have had the same effect. If there's definitely two parts to it. There are there's the people on the other end. Although I mean, sometimes there are beautiful questions. If you're talking about a solo inventor, uh, sometimes they ask the question and then they answer it. But sure. oftentimes, you know, it has to be the question has to not only um, energize the person asking it, but it has to energize the people that hear it. And they have to. That's part of what makes it beautiful is that p other people hear it. And they go, and instead of going, oh yeah, whatever, they go, wow, I hadn't really thought of it that way. You know, that's an interesting way of looking at it. And when that happens, that's part of how you know you've got a beautiful question is the reaction. And uh, Mark, people ask me this all the time, like, how do you know if something is a great question? And that's one of the things I say, you know by the reaction. You know by the reaction it gets with people around you because if it's a really great question, they will they will be moved by it, and it, you will see that in them. Yeah, and I, I I literally had that question on my paper here. Like, how do you know you're making progress? You know you're making progress by the response that your questions are getting. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Now, now um, so I I'm also interested in um, your arguing for the art and science of questioning that we uh, should uh, get better at it, spend more time, do it more deliberately. What would you say is at stake? Like, why, to put it bluntly, why should we care? Well, we should care because um, it, if, if we're not asking questions, everything is going to hell. <laughs> Basically, that's the okay. way I would put it. <laughs> If we're not asking questions, we are resting on our existing knowledge. And if we're doing that, we're not keeping up. We're not growing as people. Our businesses are going to fall apart because they will not keep up with innovation. Um, our political systems will break down because if people are not asking questions, uh, then you get a situation where people are simply spouting their own positions and uh, you know, going up against each other with solid ingrained positions that they're not movable on. So it even this even crosses over into the political space where you really need both sides to be questioning each other um, and questioning themselves, questioning their own beliefs and their own dogma. Uh, otherwise, you get locked into this, you know, battle. And, and so, um, so I think it's uh, basically the key to almost everything you know and being a questionologist of course i'm biased i understand that but i think it relates to almost every aspect of our lives and if and if we are not pushing ourselves to ask questions more we can easily fall into the trap of assuming um resting on our existing knowledge uh being comfortable um, not challenging ourselves, 
not wondering about things. So it, it, we really have to avoid that trap. And the way we avoid that trap is by exercising this questioning muscle that we had when we were kids. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we were born with this. And uh, unfortunately, we don't use it as we grow older. We probably don't use it as much as we should. So uh, you, the argument for asking more questions, for being more critical, for being more aware, um, I get that. Um, but I'm also curious, in the questions we ask, do you feel that there's also something missing? So are the current, like we're generalizing and I get that, but uh, are the current questions we're asking good enough or is there in general something missing? often there's something missing and the thing that's missing can be summed up in one word. The thing that's missing is often thought. So a good question is a thoughtful question. In other words, you don't ask it reflexively. You don't ask it automatically. You don't ask it out of pure uh, anger or emotion. Um, you ask it out of thought and curiosity. And if, if that in, is an ingredient in your questions, they will automatically become better questions. Um, but if you ask questions out of habit, um, I often talk about rote questions, R-O-T-E, rote. Uh, how are you? What's up? What's going on? You know, those are rote questions. They don't mean anything. They, we ask them out of, you know, habit. And, and what, do they, what do they get back? You get back rote answers. So a rote answer would be fine. Yeah, whatever. I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, and so a lot of our questioning is, is not, there's not much thought behind it. And then there's all kinds of other weird stuff that comes into questioning. Sometimes we use it to criticize people. Uh, you know, well, what were you thinking? What's wrong with you? You know, so I think um, if you can put more um, actual wonder into your questions and say, you know, if your question can be based on, hey, I really want to know something, you know, um, I'm really wondering about this then it, it starts to become a better question. Mm. So uh, the superficial questions, like the habitual, yeah. the superficial, which uh, which just the only thing they do is fill up the air, right? Fill up the, right. the space rather than helping you progress forward in whatever way that might be in your relationship and finding new ideas and solving a problem. Absolutely. And, mm. and the other thing to watch out for is questions with an agenda, you know, where you... Um, you th the question is based on an answer that you already think you know or an answer that you want to get there are times when i understand people using those in a courtroom a lawyer may be asking those kinds of questions if you are a teacher and you're using the socratic method you may be asking questions where you already know the answer and you're trying to but in general i have a problem with questions that are simply, you know, where a person is asking a question and they think they know the answer already. And they say, isn't it true that blah, 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 or haven't you realized, haven't you thought about the fact that this, so in other words, they're coming from this position of, I know already, I'm asking you something, but I already know. Mm. And I think people do that a lot. And, and it causes them to use questioning, not in the best way. Uh, and it causes that. So if you bring any kind of an agenda, like, for instance, now, you know, there's a there's a lot of questioning going on that I feel has a political agenda behind it, where people are saying, oh, I'm going to I'm going to question the vaccine. Why should I believe in it? You know, and so I, that's fine. I'm OK with questioning almost anything, including vaccines. But if you are coming into it with already having a position like. I'm anti whatever, I'm anti-government or whatever, and that's why I'm questioning the vaccine. So in other words, your agenda is driving the questioning. Can we, can we ask questions without an agenda? I, I think I know the answer, but... Um... We can. Or the agenda can be a very, a very positive one. The uh -huh. agenda can be... Uh, I, if the agenda is, you know, I want to learn, that's fine. That's a good agenda, you know. So, so uh, maybe I should modify to it to qu a positive agendas, ge agendas that are going to lead to something uh, good, or agendas that are that have that are um, basically good in nature. 
agendas that are also remaining. There's an agenda, but it's open. It's an open-minded agenda. So it's not an agenda where you're coming in and you know you feel you know already, and you you know you, you have an agenda. Maybe you want to create something or you want to learn something. But you're very open. You're you're not coming in feeling like I already know how to create this. I already know all the truth about it. I know my agenda is only to learn, and I'm going to be very open as I ask questions because I don't know. I'm I may learn new stuff that I don't know. So I that's the kind of mindset that I would like to see people using as their question. Yeah, a certain humble attitude uh, towards humble inquiry. Yeah, yes. Humble Inquiry. There's a wonderful book uh, called Humble Inquiry by uh, Edward Schein that I recommend it to people. But, you know, that's part of part of being a questioner is that you have to be humble. Uh, it's part of being a good critical thinker. You have to be humble. You you cannot assume that you know. I want to uh, transition a little bit into um, the design space. And I'm yes. curious if you have seen examples, and I'm sure you have, of ways we can e embed better questioning within the design space. Like you said at the start, designers are probably already quite good at it, quite aware of questioning, or maybe they are doing ju it just based on uh, habit. But we can get, we can probably do better. And what would be some ways to embed better questioning within the design field? I think, um, okay, uh, uh, there's a couple of levels to this. I'll, I'll talk about what I think the levels are, and then I'll, I'll give maybe a couple of examples of people. So I think with questioning, it starts with yourself, and it starts with developing the habit in yourself or celebrating or strengthening the habit in yourself then it extends out to others around you. So you are trying to ask more questions yourself. You're trying to do that both privately and in front of other people. And you are modeling the behavior of a questioner in front of others. Uh, then you are, uh, if you are leading an organization or a team of people, you are trying to spread that out and you're trying to sort of suggest to other people around you, hey, you know, let's ask more questions. Let's question some of these assumptions. Uh, let's, have a, let's have meetings where we, we share questions. What, what are the things we've been thinking about this week? Um, so you kind of promote the idea of question asking to the people around you. Um, if you're dealing with clients or customers, you do the same thing. You have to champion questioning in front of them. And I always start with, by the way, when I champion questioning, I start by trying to show results. And I, I start by saying, I will show innovations that have come out of questioning. So, um, you know, I'll go through uh, Airbnb or Netflix or all of these stories where the ideas began with questioning. And not only did the, the original idea come out of a question, but then oftentimes the development and growth of the company came out of continual questioning and refining of the questions. So I will show that initially just to tell people this stuff is real. You know, this is not like philosophy or what sitting around, you know, asking questions just because you think it's fun. Um, this stuff leads to things. If you're doing it well, it leads to results. And so, I think you always want to start with that saying, this is powerful. This, this is a tool that gets results. And then you want to encourage doing it more and try to figure out ways you can do it more. And that's for all of us to design or figure out because every organization is different. Um, I, I'm totally uh, in your corner and I, I'm a deep believer in the power of questioning and that every great solution starts with a very good question. Um, the challenge I see, and uh, I, I'm curious if you've seen the same, is that uh, it's often people who are uh, driven by short-term results or uh, like, okay, let me rephrase this question. What is the right. reason that businesses seem to have little appetite to ask good questions? Uh, I do think it's because they, they oftentimes are driven by short-term results. And they're driven by 
uh, the actions of the sort of middle management of the company that is kind of getting things done on a daily basis. Now, in defense of, of middle managers, what I will say is they're the people that oftentimes are on tough deadlines and they really do have to they really do have to get things done and they have to <laughs> they have to produce, you know, so <laughs> so so I do I do I do understand that and sympathize with that. That's my but, son uh, walking into the episode for the people listening to the podcast. <laughs> <funny>. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so but yeah, I think just in general, you know, what what is going on is that companies are focused on results and they're focused on getting things done and they see a conflict between questioning and getting stuff done like they don't they exactly. think the two things are not related in fact they think that questioning can actually slow down exactly the process of getting things done so this is why i feel it's very important for organizations questioning almost has to come from the top um sad to say but it's true um, if the top people in the company think of themselves as questioners or begin to think of themselves that way. And by the way, I'm seeing a lot of top executives taking this attitude and this mindset. It's happening. But it has to come from them because they will then give permission to the middle managers and the other people. And once they do that, um, then things start to change a little bit. So they need to get that message to the company, hey, yeah, we are about deadlines. We do have to produce, but we also have to have a vision and we also have to innovate. So what I'm asking you to do is both. I'm asking you to hit the deadlines and be a producer, but I'm also asking you to be a questioner and an innovator. And I'll give you some space to do that. I'll give you some, if you need a little time or something, I'll give you that. So, so um when you start to ask questions in a business environment, it often goes against the uh, grain of what they want to do. And the thing they want to do is um, standardized. They want to have predictability. They want less uncertainty. And what you do with questioning is you open up new opportunities, but at the same time, like you disrupt the process that's going on. And um, I've seen that a lot, and that's very limiting and can be disheartening for somebody who wants to create change because that's what happens when you ask good questions. And uh, your message that it has to come from the top, I totally get that. But is there like there are the intermediate steps that you've seen? Like sometimes we don't, we we, don't, we aren't we don't have a seat at the boardroom table yet, so we need to work our way up or make progress happen anyway. And next to sort of giving, um, uh, uh, showing, uh, questioning yourself. Are there any other things we could do to still thrive in that environment? I think just showing if you can show that, okay, so start at, let's say we start at the bottom and we start at the people that are producing things, creating things, having direct interactions with customers or clients. Um, we start at the field level, right? Um, and if those people are bringing in more questioning style into their work, and then if they see some positive results from that, and then they can take that, talk about that positive result to the next person up the, up the chain, and then that person hopefully talks about it to the next person up the chain. And meanwhile, I think what's going on is, you, you may not realize it, but these people at the top you know, they do know what's going on in the world. You know, they do. Um, the good ones, anyway, the decent ones. I mean, there are some out there. I have run across some CEOs that have no interest in this subject at all. They've said to me, I don't care. I don't want to know. Um, but in fact, I had one CEO say, I don't want my people asking questions. I want them producing. I want them working. He's honest. Okay, that's the way he feels. Great. I think he's going to lose out in the long run. I think he's going to lose to his competitors. And I think his employees are going to leave him for better companies. But that's his choice. He can make that choice. However, what I will say is most CEOs are aware of this. They're aware of what I'm talking about. They may not have implemented it yet, but they know about it. They understand it. They see the value in it. They may not yet fi have figured out how to make it part of the culture but they see the value. So in other words, what I'm saying is 
they are receptive to this message if it's coming from outside or if it's coming from below bubbling up through the company they're going to be receptive to it a lot of them and they're going to say you know i understand why this is important because i've been hearing about it and i know it's important in my gut and so i'm really interested in what you're saying about how questioning produced a positive result and and what do you think we can do to get this to be more a part of the company. I think you're going to see that attitude in many, many leaders. Um, not all, uh, you know, you won't, but you will see it in many. So have you found um, a pattern in the people who do get this? Like, is there, what is the argument or the narrative that they buy into the people who do sort of want to run with it? Uh, they are simply progressive about how they run their company. They are not locked in. They're not locked into a, uh, oftentimes it's founders. Founders are very good at this because they came up as innovators. They started as innovators, but it doesn't have to be founders. It can be, I've, I've seen people who are second generation leaders or third generation leaders, and they can be very innovative, especially sometimes they have come from a company that was an innovative company and they were brought in because they were innovative and that's why they're in this position as the leader. So I think um, as long as the leader has some type of an attitude of believing in innovation, uh, believing in the potential of their people, believing those kinds of things, as long as they have that, then they're going to be open to this mindset. If they're kind of an old school, you know, I think of leaders as being new school or old school. The old school leaders, you know, they act like generals in the army, you know, and they're like, you follow my orders. I know what I'm doing. I know everything. Those are old school leaders. We still have some of those. I think they're dying. I think they're a dying breed. I think the new breed, which is going to be much more prevalent, is a leader who is more open minded, uh, more curious, uh, more questioning, more appreciative of the people working for them. Um, that's the new model for leadership. And it's going to be you know, those, the only people who are going to do well, in my opinion, in the new world are the people who embrace that model of leadership. Those old authoritarian leaders, they're going to have big problems. But one thing, people are not going to work for them. You know, people have changed. They don't want some old guy who thinks he knows everything yelling at them all day and telling them what to do. They won't stand for it. Totally agree, and uh, we are luckily seeing them. They're they're not the typical service design client anyway. Uh, so uh, yeah. Well, you know, in the service business, you have to learn to listen adapt. and adapt. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You, know, you can't be this kind of a know-it-all who uh, know-it-all dictator. You know, you can't. It just doesn't work in the service business. It 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 works in very few businesses, but there are some old-fashioned businesses where someone produces a widget, you know, or some little little thing, right? And their family has been producing it for a hundred years and they've made a lot of money. And a lot of times those people are not too open to change because they feel like, hey, we know how to make this widget. We're just gonna keep doing it. But you know what? Their time's gonna run out eventually. You mentioned something about showing uh, results. And um, this is also one of the things I'm curious about if you have some tips, tricks, tools. Um, what what are some good questions to start with that help you to show results? And results, like I know that they can be, they are super context dependent. It depends on your audience, but um, have you seen certain types of questions that really quickly lead to tangible results? Because the Airbnb example, like somebody could say that, take, that takes years to get there. And yeah. We don't have years. Yeah. We need we need something to show next week. So, are there any right. easy ways in? I don't know that there's any easy answers to that. I, I think that questions can produce all kinds of results. They can produce short term, quick results as well as long term. For instance, if you are asking questions about a uh, a let's say a gap in the market right now, you know, I've been I've done a little, some work with Starbucks, right? So if Starbucks is asking good questions, which they often are, they're very much a question in culture now. And, um, and so they are constantly asking about 
what is going on in people's tastes and in their um, habits. And then they are trying to quickly respond to that. You know, so, so we have a new uh, product that can hit this emerging trend that can immediately bump up there. They can see immediate results on that because they're hitting with something that just works at this moment in time. And it might not have worked yesterday, might not work tomorrow, but it works right now. And the way they got to that product was by asking a lot of questions they had. And it's not just the people at the top. It has to be, you know, with Starbucks, they are trying to get this out there so that the people at the uh, at, at the at the ground level, the, the baristas, the people in the coffee shops, they are the ones who should be asking a lot of questions, too, because they're going to figure out, um, you know, this is I'm asking my customers what they how they feel about this or that. And they're saying, yes, this is what we like. This is what we're interested in right now. And then they are able to take that input and bring it back to their home office. The home office is very receptive. They want to hear this, you know. So um, what I would say to people is, you know, you want to be asking questions at all levels of the company. You want your people at all levels to be trained to ask questions of customers, then you want them to feel comfortable bringing that back to their, their managers, their superiors, and being able to share it. The, the, the managers have to be open to it. The managers have to be asking for it. The managers have to be asking, what have you learned? What are you hearing? What are you, what are you finding out? And then they, the, whole, the questions have to be flowing in all directions, all the way up to the top. And the top person has to be asking, OK, what's going on out there? I want to hear from everybody. What's happening? What is going on? What are we doing in this area? What are we looking at here? What are we, you know, it has to be all the questions are flowing in every every which way. Now, that's a lot harder than it than it sounds, because you have to develop systems that allow that to happen. And I think this ties into what you mentioned at the start is that um it has to it has to be um, uh, an art and science and you have to develop it you have to see uh, another guest on the show mentioned question literacy you have to sort yeah. of show that you can actually get better at it and that there are um, more qu the questions that yield more valuable answers than other questions I think the problem is one of the challenges is that people have been disappointed by questions and sort of right. questions that just f filled up the air rather than helping them to progress towards the thing that they want to. And so, yeah, well, that's, you know, you yeah. can actually you can actually train people because like one exactly. of the things you can. Yeah, you can do. And actually, Starbucks is was was uh, when I was working with them, they started using a exercise that that I had been uh, that I shared with them, which is just very simple. And it's about question formulation. So you you get people in a room, you give them a challenge and you have them attack the challenge through uh, constant questioning. So they may try to come up with uh, 50 questions around this problem. We're having a problem with customer retention on this issue here. How do we let's come up with 50 questions about that? So Starbucks started using that model. And, uh, you know, the, what they're what you're doing there is you're just strengthening the habit. You're you're getting people to think. If you think of questioning as a way of thinking, you want to get people to use that way of thinking almost habitually, and then they will be more comfortable with it, and they'll they'll know how to do it better. They will get better at it. Uh, part of this exercise involves not only coming up with lots of questions, but then you work on your questions. Can we make this question more specific? Uh, what if we combine this question with that question? We put them together. So there are things, what if we open up the question or what if we close it? Um, there are things you can do and you teach people, you get people in the habit of doing this and then they'll start to do it automatically when they're at work, uh, when they're coming up, when they're dealing with customers, they'll start to use this as a, a more natural skill. Is this maybe one of the things that we take for granted and the thing that makes uh, practicing questioning so hard that people think like, like anyone can ask a question? Right. It, it seems yeah, so I, easy. I think it's true. And and it's the true. and the thing you articulate, the thoughtfulness, and that there are different angles, and there are better and and worse worse questions. It, 
is like that is that a big misconception yeah i mean Th that I think, it's easy I, I think yeah i think people think it's like breathing you know everyone can do it you know and 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 part of the reason they think that is because we all know that young children ask a lot of questions so so that makes you think oh it's just it's a childish behavior so if a child can do it that means it doesn't it's no big deal because if a five-year-old can do it so what then anyone can do it but that's not true <laughs> because the truth is this is one of those areas where a five-year-old is better than we are they're stronger than we are when it comes to asking questions they have less filters they have more humility they have more open wonder they have their eyes are more wide open so in other words a child is actually a better questioner than we are so it's wrong for us to think oh if a child can do it anyone can do it what the way i put it to people is we almost have to go back to that five-year-old state of being in order to be better questioners in other we have to imitate the five-year-old we have to be more open-minded we have to be more bold, um, not be such, you know, scared of asking questions. If a five-year-old isn't scared, they'll ask anything. Um, so we need to, in some ways, mimic that behavior and then bring our own strength to it. Our own strength is that we know, we know more than the five-year-old. We know a lot of stuff. And as long as we're humble about that, about our knowledge and say, well, our knowledge could be really useful. It could also be wrong. Uh, there may be some things we're wrong about, but we can bring that knowledge into the questioning process. And now our questions will be stronger for it. They'll be better. But we need some of those behaviors of the five-year-old, the open-mindedness and the willingness to ask. And, and I like what you're uh, uh, saying here is that a first step could very well be just showing the gap and the things that we are currently missing in our questioning, like the boldness and... Uh, um, uh, the curiosity and, and uh, um, and the thoughtfulness, the thoughtfulness. Yeah. So the deliberateness, the, the idea that you're going to spend time on your question, you know, and, and this is something I, th I think I developed a habit as a journalist because I would go into an interview and I would know I'm only going to have a few questions with this person. And if I don't ask the best questions, the interview might not go very well. So I would sit down and think about, the questions I was going to ask. Now, how many people do that? Not many. How many people sit down and yeah, you probably do because you're doing a podcast, but it, every, everyday people, how many of them sit down and really work on their questions and scratch them out and rewrite them and reword them? Most people don't do that. So that kind of thoughtfulness is very important. <clears throat> and um, I, I, on the one hand, I get that. Like you, it feels, and you mentioned it, it feels like slowing down. It feels like taking a step back. Uh, and you sort of have to get over that. Maybe it's fear uh, right. that you're going to invest time up front. Like this is the classic Einstein quote where he's going to spend 55 minutes figuring out what the question is and then five minutes for the solution. But right. I, th I think you have to go through that process a few times to build the confidence that it's okay and it's actually beneficial to right. be thoughtful about your questions because the answers and the solutions will be so much easier but if you're just constantly under pressure to move forward and come up with answers like fine you have to pull the brakes somewhere and and yeah, break, break that habit it's not easy to do but you know the one thing people have to realize and managers have to realize this and leaders have to realize that is when your total focus is on producing and getting things done, you will get things done. There's no doubt about it. You will get things done. But the question is, will you be doing the right things? Exactly. Something's going to get done, but it may not be the right thing. Exactly. So I, I tend to think of question. It's interesting. You can think of questioning as categories, right? You can think of why questions. You can think of what if questions, and you can think of how how questions. Now, people who are very results oriented. They're how people. So the only question they're asking is, how are we going to get it done? How much is it going to cost? How can we do it faster? How, how, how? And you need that. You definitely need that. Those people are really important. But what I say is that sometimes they're missing the why and the what if. They're missing the questions that direct you to the how. 
So they're missing the front end. They're missing the front end of the process and they're on the back end. And so uh, I think that this is a big adjustment for businesses to realize it's a full cycle and you got to get it to get it right. You have to be asking the right why questions. Why are we doing this in the first place? Um, does it still make sense? It might have made sense two years ago, but does it still make sense now? You have to think about those questions before you get to the how, 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 how are we going to do it? I think a lot it's of a big adjustment. Though. Yeah, I think a lot of designers are right now cheering uh, while listening to this episode, because this is, I think, what a lot of our designers are arguing for. Let, let's figure out what the right thing is to do and then figure out how to do it the right way. Um, and and this, uh, listen, Mark, this is the designer's role in this process. It is. I mean, they, they, it's their responsibility if they're not if they're not being the voice of reflection, thoughtfulness, asking why, if they're not doing that, then it might not happen. It might not get done. So it's so critical for the designer to be, whether, whether it's a person within the company who's playing that role or whether it's an outside designer, it's so important for them to be the people who are asking the questions that nobody else is willing to ask or that nobody else has time for. Everyone else doesn't have time. And I, I think that um, one of the frustrations of many designers is that they, they are asking these questions, but they are not being appreciated for it. In right. a world where everything evolves around the how, like the why questions aren't being appreciated to the extent they should be. Yeah, the only thing I'll say to that is that questioners often have had this resistance through the years. And it's and it's part of the it seems to be part of the uh, territory. It comes with the territory. You are you are going to encounter resistance and you are going to have people that that doubt the value of what you are doing and who think you are, uh, you know, just slowing things down or upsetting the process or whatever. And so I feel like there's almost no getting away from that. That is a responsibility that when you're in that role, you have to sort of take on. And uh, and this is true for all kinds of people who are in advisory roles. I mean, it's true of coaches, it's true of consultants, it's true of designers. If you are gonna be the person that comes in and helps people rethink or think better, you have to be willing to take the heat that comes with that because they're go they're not going to like it that you're <laughs> you are changing things you're disrupting a little bit and they're not necessarily going to like that and uh, uh thank you for mentioning this because this is very comforting uh it's it's part of the game it's part of uh it change it's part of disruption and um you, you have always to... encounter resistance there's always going to be resistance you'll always be a minority yeah yeah yeah, yeah absolutely it's it's just it's part of the game and don't let that discourage you. Uh, um, and I think, um, right, with, and I was thinking like, what are some uh, tools that designers can use to get the rest of the people, the how people more into the why people? And I really think your book is like uh, uh, a Trojan horse because it's not packaged as design, right? It's, it's, right. it's packaged as a New York Times bestseller. Put it on right. the shelf of a few people, and uh, that will sort Absolutely. of that that, you that know what will I say to, marinate them. Yeah, you know what I say to people, Mark is is make questioning part of your own brand as a person, where whatever level you are within a company or within an organization or whatever, make yourself the questioning guy or 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 woman, right? Um, and make it part of who you are, because then you can be you will be seen that way in the company and as long as you don't do it in an annoying way <laughs> you know i have seen people do this in an annoying way so I, I will say as a caveat be careful about being the sort of gadfly in the company the person who asks like um uh what, what do you call them? devil's advocate questions all the time and just is doing it as i said you know be careful of be, having an agenda behind your questions where I want to make myself look good or I want to make myself seem smart. I want everyone to see how smart I am. If you've got that kind of an agenda, be careful because that's going to make your questioning annoying to people. But if you can bring positivity uh, only about growth, only about learning, only about getting better, um, if you can have that be the, um, 
the, the genesis or the basis of your questions, then I think people will love it. And, mm. and you can be, you will be valued by, I mean, clients may say, you know, they may laugh about it. They may say, oh, that, and there, there, there he goes with another one of those questions. They'll laugh about it, but at the same time, they will appreciate it. They'll understand that you're bringing something to the party here that's really important. And, and it's, it's great that uh, we can use this as part of our brand and be more explicit about it, that this is actually a skill and a quality that we bring to the table rather than um, just just doing it uh, intuitively. Like, use it to your advantage. Be, be very transparent. And, and, and also point out to people that they can use it to their advantage too. You know, Even better. It's not anything, yeah. you don't have to have a master's degree in this. It's really a habit. And if they are willing to try to pick up the habit too, they can have some of these, they can get some benefits out of it also. I've got uh, two more questions left and then we are sort of wrapping up this episode. If people remember one thing uh, from this conversation, what do you hope it is? I hope they remember that questions are valuable and questions can help organizations and people in all kinds of ways. So give them their respect that they are due. Pay attention to questions, spend time questioning and talk about the value of questioning with people around you. Uh, that's what I would, that's the most important thing. Uh, can I share one other thought? Go ahead. One other thing, one other thought I'll give you is find your own question. I, I, I love to tell people, find your own beautiful question. It may be about your work. It may be about something you're trying to improve in your work, or it may be about your life, but, Find some big ambitious question that you'd like to pursue and just make that a question you're going to work on for a while. I, I think that that's uh, great. My, my beautiful question is how can I spread the word about questioning? So that's something, I mean, I can work on that forever. There's no, there's no end to that question, but it's a thing I can follow and a thing I can pursue. Awesome. Like that uh, advice. And uh, if people want to comment on this episode with their beautiful question, I'd love to know. It would be great. There's one uh, more thing left to do. And um, we're going to do a small contest, Warren. Uh, and we're going to do, uh, we're going to give away a signed copy of the book. Right? Now, you had a question in mind. And... Uh, it's a simple question, but that's uh, the whole purpose. What do people need to answer in order to make a chance to win a signed copy of the okay, book? Okay, so the, the, the book we're giving away is called The Book of Beautiful Questions. Uh, however, it is based on a previous book that had a similar but different title. So I would like the first person to answer what was the name of the book that led to The Book of Beautiful Questions. Awesome. That's it. Leave a comment uh, down below this episode. Uh, we'll do a raffle. So all the good answers will go into a big hat and then uh, somehow we'll randomly pick a winner uh, and we'll ship the book to anywhere in the world. Warren, it was awesome having you on this show. Like I was reading this book every single morning during my breakfast and I loved it. I'm uh, recommending it to everybody. So it was uh, uh, a great honor to uh, have a face-to-face -face virtual conversation yeah. with you. Thank you for coming on. Sure, I, I really enjoyed it and uh, hope we get to talk again sometime soon. And by the way, those are great questions you asked. Thank you. If you've made it all the way here, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Now, don't forget to participate in the book giveaway contest. The only thing you have to do is to post a comment down below answering the question to which book is the book of beautiful questions a follow-up to. All the details of the contest are also in the video description. So check that out. Thanks a lot for watching to the Service Design Show. If you want more, check out the next video that I've got lined up for you. See you there.